So, um, well, actually, good morning. <laughs> um, first off, I'm John Garland. Uh, I'm a consultant and instructor with uh, Wintellect, um, also a Microsoft MVP. My email address and my Twitter handle are down there. Most important, my Twitter handle, um, I'll go ahead and put the code in the slides. Um, I'll at least tweet the link. Um, and then I'll also work with the folks here at Code on the Beach to, to figure out where to, to, to put this stuff so folks can get at it. Um, I mentioned I work for Wintellect. We do um, consulting, we, um, uh, application development. Um, like I said, I mentioned a minute ago, a lot of cloud, uh, a lot of uh, modern web these days. Um, do so, a lot of training. Uh, and we also have the, uh, an on-demand training video, uh, about 300 level courses offering that we provide. The, the big gist of what I want to talk about today is kind of starts with this. You know, you've got the, 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 the best idea ever for an application. Fantastic. You know what you're going to do with it. But the app somehow needs to be bigger than the device that it's running on. It needs to be, you know, you need to do things like, OK, well, how do I take things that I save here and have them appear over there on my other device? Or how do I share them with other people who might be interacting with the same application? Um, what do I do when I don't have network connectivity? Um, how do I deal with notifications and other things that are kind of inherent to, to this mobile app world that we're now in? Oh, and by the way, at some point, as I figure all that out, I actually have to write the app that's at the heart of all of this. So that's where we get into these things called backends as a service or mobile backends as a service, BAS or MBAS. Um, so, and again, the, the, the high level definition, just server services uh, provided by a variety of vendors that basically commoditize, or at least try to commoditize, a lot of the standard stuff that you would expect out of most mobile applications. Um, provide a streamlined entry into these things. Things like data access, um, authentication and authorization, um, synchronization for, for offline scenarios, notifications, um, other things are you know, scalability and, and, and things like that. And there's a bunch of vendors out there providing those solutions today. Apps, things like uh, uh, just a few of them here, Appcelerator, Telerik has the background services. Uh, Parse was a service that was purchased by Facebook. It's been slated for closing. Um, and when they did, everybody kind of jumped on and said, hey, here's how you port your parse to my area. Um, and then, uh, but also the parse server is being offered as a open source for people to go ahead and install onto their own um, cloud or hosting environments. Kinvi has a solution, AWS has its mobile hub, and obviously we're t talking today, um, Azure has its mobile apps. And, and the big thing is, okay, well, why do I want all of this? It's, you know, somebody's providing this. You just told me the nightmare story about Parse. What, what, why, why do I want to get into all of this? And, and it really comes down to the key question is, what do you want your people to spend their time doing, or you or your people? Um, where are you going to invest your energy? Yes, you can write these things. Um, a, a Carl Sagan quote I like to refer to, something along the lines of, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, first you have to invent the universe. Um, when it comes down to it, at some point we do slice into frameworks that other people provide for us and you make a choice about where you're, you're, you're making that slice. And this is a fairly high level slice where w you can kind of allow some of the back end stuff, especially if your, your needs are uh, uh, line up with what they're providing, let somebody else deal with all the, 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 nu the, the nuances and the details there and you focus on the little area that you're really, really good at, turn it into your app. And, and, and go forward from there. Talking about the Azure Mobile Services off offering in particular, there, it really is a framework. It started out as kind of, um, it was its own thing within the Azure ecosystem, and then Azure has evolved its web hosting, uh, its, its high-end platform as a service web hosting offering, um, and took a lot of things out of mobile services and made them available to all web uh, apps that it hosts uh, in, in this way. So app services has kind of evolved from being an all-in-one, or sorry, web, uh, mobile apps has evolved from being an all-in-one thing sitting uh, uh, by itself in Azure to now a framework that you can tap into, a client and a server framework, 
that sits on top of this thing that offers all of these services. The thing that I'm talking about is the Azure App Services. And it's a family of services that are provided as platform as a service. Um, it includes the web apps, the logic apps, the uh, API apps, mobile apps, I'm talking about today, and, and the new thing, um, the serverless computing, they call it the functions uh, uh, functionality. Um, in the mobile app server side, you actually get two choices of how you're going to deploy. You can either deploy on a Node.js runtime with uh, JavaScript kind of being the, the server side uh, scripting uh, tooling, or you can use the uh, .NET uh, web API based code. Slight difference, some subtle differences there. Um, the Node.js based one gets you options to do things um, like uh, what they call easy tables and easy APIs, where just from the portal you can go ahead and provision your tables and your incoming data will work uh, with, with what they call dynamic schema. As data comes in and is targeted to a table in the database, it'll say, oh, okay, these are the columns. It doesn't have this one. We'll go ahead and add this extra column for you. The schema will grow. And there's a point at which you can lock that down. So you can kind of develop and whack away at it, and it'll kind of figure out your schema based on the data you're throwing at it. And then when you're ready for production, you can say, OK, stop it. Only let real data in here, and, and, and don't let anything weird happen. And it kind of, the, the Node.js gives you a little bit of a um, easier entry, uh, you know, a little less uh, work ahead of time to enter, a little less ceremony to get into it. And it's, I, I don't want to say that it is, uh, you know, a, kind of a toy or a kit framework because it actually is a, a, a framework on top of Node. You can pull down the code, you can interact with the code, you can do all the Node things that you can do in Node and make it a full, big, rich application. It just gives you a, 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 a smaller starting footprint if you want to use that. Um, whereas the .NET version, it's a uh, you know ASP.NET MVC project, and it's the C# -sharp that that you know and love and been working with for forever. Um, all the server components are open source. On the client side, just as important as the server piece are the client libraries, and the server. The whole function of the server is to provide REST APIs for your application to call into almost kind of manufacture them for you. The client side abstracts away any goo of communicating with that. Um, available for several platforms, we've got you know, Windows, Xamarin, Android, iOS, uh, Cordova, and just a raw HTML5 um, uh, uh, client side uh, SDKs that they provide. Again, all open source. Uh, if your platform isn't listed, hey, you, you, know, you can look at the code for the other ones and kind of use that as inspiration if you need it. Um, you can also make raw REST calls if you want, but these things abstract away a lot of the, the nonsense. The Nuance Plus, they handle the um, uh, offline sync for you all in the client, and they've got that, inter how to interact with a local database and everything else. So at this point, let's actually stop talking about it and actually take a look at it. When you're working with Azure, you start out by obtaining an Azure subscription. And there's a bunch of different ways of getting an Azure subscription. Um, if you've got, um, well, you can just go up and get one and put a credit card against it, and here you go. There's getting started offers. Uh, they vary from month to month what they're offering. It's you know, something along the lines of 30 days unlimited access for, uh, with $200 of stuff to play with, um, or some variant of, of that. If you're in a uh, small business, there's uh, offers through the um, BizSpark program. Um, there's educational offers. There's a ton of ways of getting into this, um, but, and, and then there's just the regular uh, subscription. But once you get a subscription, you will interact with Azure primarily through the Azure portal at portal.azure.com. And this is what I have up here. Um, I've got the portal, and we've got our resources uh, going on the left. These are the, you know, just kind of a quick view of some of the things that we may be interested in. Um, this big uh, dashboard type surface area here in the middle. To get a mobile service going, a, a mobile app going, I can go here and select New, Web and Mobile, and down here you'll see Mobile App. I select a mobile app, and I'm asked to provide a name for the mobile app, and uh, DNG My Demo. Um, notice that it's part, you know, it's kind of suggests there, AzureWebsites.net. 
underneath it, it's actually part of a URL. So the name you give it has to be unique enough to allow it to be a URL and, and, and universally accessible. And it also has to align to, to URL rules. You, know, you can't put you know, certain characters in there and whatnot. Um, if you have multiple subscriptions, which subscription this is going to go into, what it's going to bill against. Resource groups are um, units of grouping stuff, to like things, uh, things on a related project together, if you will, um, within Azure. And then you can select an app service plan. And the app service plan basically becomes the unit of resources and billing for things in this app services world. Um, as an example, if you go ahead and select to create a new one over here, yeah, you have to give it a name, DNG My Demo, and a region or a location into which uh, where this will be deployed, um, and a pricing tier. And I'll go to View All. There's a bunch of pricing tiers here. And you'll see, OK, this is, like I said, the unit of scale and feature and billing. So as we kind of scroll down, we see the premium. You've got you know, this kind of storage, this amount of RAM on the machines. It can scale to this m number of instances of these, all the way down here to free and, and shared. Basically, you would select one of these, and that's the resources that you get. An interesting thing that, about the app services uh, family, you can put multiple things into one app service plan. So if you have a mobile app and it needs some back-end services to talk to, but your store policy for the, the app store that you're deploying in requires you to have a privacy policy or a terms of use and an online website, you can go ahead and actually put a web app into the same app service plan that your services are billing against, drop your two web pages in there, and that's your URL. That'll give you your URL to your um, privacy policy or, or those other websites. It, it builds against, it ticks against the same resources. Presumably, those things aren't going to have the same amount of high usage that, that your API itself would. Um, so you can just go ahead and, and you know, use a, a fraction of your available uh, bandwidth, if you will, for those things within the same billing. You don't need to create a whole new billing unit and new charges and everything else for, for just that one little part of your app. I am not going to hit build on this. I'm going to go to one that was prefab, just in the interest of, of time here. And so I come to a node one. We'll spend most of our time today in the ASP.NET stuff, in the, M, in the .NET end, but I wanted to show the node one just, OK, what does it look like? Um, the Azure portal was changed as of Thursday, um, so keep an eye out. The, the portal changes frequently, and, and in this case, it was a pretty big swing. Um, but here is the mobile app and the features of the mobile app, the URLs for getting a hold of it, the app service plan it's a part of, the various settings. And here's the features that it offers, the app service plan that it's in, uh, rules and, and, and ways for um, scaling uh, up or out, meaning you know, bigger machines or more machines. Um, quick start information, so um, ways to download. Let's see if this will. Yeah. We can download projects that are set up to do a canonical to-do app and, and start working with the code directly from there. So, um, you know, go ahead and you know, set up the back end to work, download a Visual Studio project, and, 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 and start working with that. Um, oops. Again, they changed the portal, and I'm not used to what closes what now. Um, and OK, so all the way down here in mobile, we'll see we've got this easy tables, easy APIs, data connections, and push. The data connections is what data source you're connecting to at the back end. I've got this configured to uh, talk to a SQL Azure database. Um, another option is um, uh, with, with the uh, C, uh, well, I'll talk about another option here in a moment. But I've got one table created in here, and I can add tables or I can import tables from CSV. Uh, this is in the easy tables thing that's available for the um, node back end. And I can see I've got a variety, I've got a schema here. I can edit. Let me, if I hit edit, it brings up a nice little login screen. It brings up a editor with my project ready to go. 
I can actually, in this table read function, I can go ahead and write uh, JavaScript that interacts with the data as it's coming in before or after it goes to the database. And I can do the same thing for post and patch um, and, and to, to, to handle the back end business logic that needs to execute um, as the data is coming from my client application up to my server. Likewise, again, it's a, you don't have to do the, the web-based editor. You can go ahead and download the node project and work from there. How are we doing on time here? OK. So again, the portal kind of becomes the, the, the place where you go to manage and to work with a lot of this. But like I said, this is a combination of a service in Azure and code, code frameworks for working on this. So let's actually get into the, the code side of things. Um, First off, a little more talking. First thing I want to talk about is uh, data and API access. So in mobile apps, data is accessed with this table abstraction. You treat data as a collection of tables hosted up in the cloud somewhere. And you do have different backend storage options. Um, out of the box, you can deal with SQL Azure or SQL Server. You can do um, SQL with auto mapper, so if your data transfer objects don't line up exactly with what you're storing in the database, you can use auto mapper to kind of re-cajigger them a little bit. Um, you can also use Azure tables, uh, although Azure tables are a little quirky when it comes to the, um, the offline sync support. There was support a while back, or, or at least a uh, conversation about support for Mongo, but that just hasn't really um, come to, to full fruition. Um, there's also been talk about support for, um, I'll call them non-traditional stores like um, Salesforce and Dynamics CRM. I think there's some um, open source projects out there that have implemented that to some degree, um, but I couldn't tell you the link off the top of my head. And, and then there's also, I know, been discussion about Document DB as kind of being another popular Azure hosted data store that, that people might want to use, and, and that's... Um, uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about that. I don't know where it is in terms of coming to fruition. But initially, SQL and Azure Tables. Um, I'm, I mentioned earlier, you can actually write code that executes on the server as these requests are being made from your app to the server to execute logic. Things like validation, because you can validate all you want on the client, but it's not real validation until you're validating in the server. Um, and also, again, any data manipulation or, or, or other business rules that need to happen there. Um, and hopefully I've illustrated here, your client app can call stuff to the table controllers that goes to data storage, but there's also this API controller. Not everything fits into the world of a REST call with data on the back end. Sometimes you want to say, start a job or do something. It's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily store data and retrieve data. Um, to that end, we can have just a custom controllers, API controllers, they're called. And all it is is you can go ahead and drop uh, REST methods in on there that, that just do a task for you. Or REST endpoints, sorry, that do a task for you. Now let's take a look at this. So what I have here, let me bring up Visual Studio. I've got this nice little Xamarin project here. And I've got my great little application. And um, what this application does, let's spin it up. And we've got the Android client here. And we'll go ahead and get this UWP version of it fired up. spend all morning resizing things. Um, so I've got the application, and, and it's you know, this fantastic functionality in that I can go ahead and set the color and the, of, of text and the, the size of the font, and I can go ahead and save it, and I can, you know, okay, go to blue, and I can reload it. And I can do the same thing over here, and, you know, save, and you know, go from maroon to pink, and reload, and, well, great. It's just an application that's saving some settings. And, and what I want to show here is kind of how can we use mobile apps 
to allow this saving functionality, but take it across different devices. So it's not just saving to one machine, but I want to save it to others. Now in the Windows 10 space, in the UWP and even the Windows uh, 8 uh, app space, you could do this because they had that roaming storage that worked across uh, OneDrive. Uh, and your OneDrive, and, and it stored in OneDrive and used your, your uh, Microsoft account credentials to, to manage all of that. Uh, and they even had it for the enterprise um, uh, uh, using your uh, organizational IDs. The problem is that only really works from Windows device to Windows device. If you've got iOS devices, if you've got Android devices, those settings, that information isn't, is opaque to them. They can't get to it. So we're going to use mobile services or mobile apps as the back end to go ahead and exchange our, save our preferences, and basically have a preferences system within our application. Um, so the first thing we'll go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and add ourselves um, a server project. And I'll go to add new project. And with the Azure SDK installed, I'll see under cloud, I've got the ability to say Azure mobile app. Now I do source my information here from my little notes, so. Um, okay. So I'll call this the Preferences Demo Server, selected Azure Mobile App, and it's going to take me to this screen saying, okay, well, great, I want to make a mobile app for you. Tell me about it. Certainly, the only template I can choose from is Azure Mobile App. You can see this okay, right? Okay. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, I do want to host this in the cloud. I don't have to set this right now, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, let's go ahead and provision this in Azure as an app that we're going to have up there. So I'm going to call it Preferences Demo Server. Uh, if you have multiple subscriptions, which subscription, uh, what resource group. I've already got an app service plan up there. I'm going to use it. Otherwise, I could go through new. And these are the kind of similar to the steps that we saw already in the cloud. Um, for services, I am going to add a database to it. And the one gotcha here that I messed up is the connection string name. You actually need a special connection string name. Um, and there, MS table connection string. If you don't have this, and what you've got to do is you've got to go up to the portal and create a connection uh, using the right under that easy API stuff, easy tables, there's data uh, connections. You create that there, and you make sure that, um, that that's the name that it selects for you. Um, so this is going to go ahead and um, allocate those resources in Azure, um, depending on, and, and also create a local project for myself, uh, for me here. And of course, we're dealing with NuGet, and we're dealing with requests to Azure, and we're dealing with Wi-Fi here. So it's going to be a moment. Um, it's been pretty peppy, adding the, the NuGet projects now. Okay. So we've got our project. And the first thing I am actually going to do in this project is I'm going to start deleting stuff. Um, it comes out of the box with this to-do sample, uh, a to-do list. And um, I've got links at the end of the project for the tutorial to walk through the to-do project. Um, it's been done. It's uh, out there. Certainly, if you're interested, you can follow it along. I wanted to do something a little bit different. So the first thing on the server, I'm going to be storing a preference of some kind. Uh, so I've got a class, a preference class I want to store. And I will call it uh, preference. I'm just going to come back here and pick up some code. and. Here's my preference class. And you'll notice it inherits from this entity data type. The entity data type brings in the additional fields. It becomes the, 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 the working unit for mobile apps to, to be able to, to manage this, this type of data. And I've got a user ID, the name of the setting, and the value of the setting. I'm going to add a controller to put this table um, as uh, an available uh, REST endpoint, basically. And I'll choose uh, Add, and I'll select New Scaffolded Item. And I'll see here, under Common Azure Mobile Apps, I can choose a mobile table controller. 
Um, a custom controller gives me just a not backed by a database table. It's just the REST endpoint, the, 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 the direct API call. In this case, I want to back it with a database table. I'll select Add. I can choose the class that I was interested in. Uh, I need an entity framework data context to interact with the, the data in the database, so I'll just have it create a new one, and the controller name is a preference controller. And it'll go ahead and spin all this up for me and put things in the right places. Um, in my preferences controller, it gave me this initialize override, and it creates this thing called a domain, or sets this value called a domain manager, which uses this entity domain manager of the type preference. And that manages all the goo for interacting with the database. There's also a table domain manager, and then there's an entity mapper. I may have my words off just a little bit, but the, the different backed storage uh, types just use different domain managers. So if you've got your own new whiz-bang storage entity or type to use, you would create just a new domain manager. Something funny's going on over there. Um, also what it's done is it's given me these methods. My get uh, all, get a single one by ID, update, insert, and delete. And it's provided basically you could, you know, just real quick boilerplate code. But if I want to do, and something we will do in a little moment here, um, if I want to add any additional logic, I can go ahead and insert this. It is working with iQueryables. And if you're familiar with, I, are, are you familiar with iQueryable or, okay. Uh, and for the benefit of the video, uh, if you're working with iQueryable, um, one of the things that that lets uh, you do, it, this does uh, work with OData um, for the queries back and forth. So in the clients, if I query the data, it isn't retrieving the gob of data first and then filtering down. It passes that filter criteria, that, that query criteria, on up to the server, and it becomes part of the executing query when it's actually going to the database. OK, so I've got my great table API. I've got my preferences API going. Let's go ahead and publish this into Azure. I can right click, select Publish. Um, and it goes ahead and brings up the, the Publish Configuration dialog. And it's mostly set up and ready to go. I'm going to web deploy it. The server name is all there. Settings, if I come over here, it is going to resolve the database information. It's, yep. And it's set for release. Um, I could also select debug, and I'll show you in a second why I would select debug. Uh, but for now, let's just do release. And I'm going to go ahead and hit publish. And this is going to fail at compiling my application because I forgot to do one critical step. Um, and that is over here in startup. When I deleted everything, it still had a little bit of initialization left over for me. So it's got the, initialize, the database initializer. and I just need that to turn that into preference. And this is just standard entity framework stuff where it's initializing the database with some content. I don't want to or care to do that, so I can just comment that out. And let's try this again. Right click, publish, uh, and hit publish. If I hit preview, it'll scroll down the files that it's, you know, these are the changes I intend to make if I was to publish this. Um, and of course, what did I do now? Uh, did I add an extra curly brace in here somewhere? OK. Don't know. We need a curly brace. We've got the curly brace that we need. Let's try this a third time. Uh, publish, publish. There we go. Now. Why would I want to debug, uh, set that to debug? One of the, the options that we have here, if I bring up this Cloud Explorer panel here, I can see the resources that I have in Azure in it. Within there, I've got the app service, uh, uh, sorry, the, the various websites. And if I've got my preferences demo server right here, if I right click on it, I can actually attach a debugger to that uh, up there. Be careful with that. That if you set a breakpoint in your app and it catches on the server, you are breaking 
your code running on the server. It won't field anybody else's requests. Something to watch out for when you're doing this in, in production, or usually you don't want to debug in production. Um, but this does support, um, as part of the app service family, it does support um, uh, deployment slots. So I can do a staging and a production deployment, and I can debug against staging and, and, and things like that. So sure enough, my mobile service has been deployed, and here's my happy little server thing. Um, not very exciting yet. Let's actually talk to this thing. But it's, you know, very quickly it was able to get deployed, and I've got functionality for saving values in the cloud. Let's actually add our, change our app to be able to, um, to do that. So the first thing we're going to do in the application is we'll come up here to manage NuGet for the solution. Come over here to browse. And let's add the client side of the framework for this. So the Azure Mobile App Client Libraries, I'll add it to everybody except for the server. Hit install. And it's going to say, hey, here are the things I'm going to do. Yep, I'm OK with that. And do I accept the licenses? Sure. So we'll bring in the NuGet packages into our three client uh, 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 projects here, the shared uh, project, uh, the PCL. And we've got one also for our Android, and we've got one for our um, UWP, our Windows project. And this will take a moment. to bring in the various NuGets. OK, so the NuGet packages are in place. I'm also going to throw away this uh, thing. It's just there to help compile, so I do the demo and the initial demo. And I've got to clean up a few reference problems. So there, there. Not there. And two more, I promise. Um, ah, too many references. And I mean, normally you don't have to do this when you're just downloading NuGets, but I tried to get things a little bit ahead of where we were so I wouldn't have to type in so much code from the ground up. OK, that should work. Let's see if I can build the solution. OK, the vast majority of our work is actually going to happen in the shared project in, in, in the Xamarin code. Um, so I've got my mobile. I've got this little helper class you'll see here. Straightforward Xamarin project. I've got a few um, partials that I've done just to break things apart. It's kind of a, a fancy way of doing regions, but, but just uh, separating the classes so I can just put the different functionality and the different um, uh, partial pieces. Um, in this case, I've got a mobile service client. And that's kind of the place where mobile service, the client side of mobile services starts. I realize it's a bit of a tautology. But this is the piece of code that coordinates your interaction with the server. You give it the URL to your server up there. And uh, if I come back here, when this thing spun up, you'll see it's that same URL that it went to. Um, so that's the URL to my service. It's the same one that I configured when I uh, created the project or when we saw the other project when I typed it in. And then I've got the client that references that URL. I'm going to add a couple of quick methods here. It's client get table uh, and get the table type of preference and then turn that to enumerable. I can also do to collection uh, async. The to collection it brings me a paginated collection down as opposed to just give me everything. I can also create a query. Um, and filter the results, say only give me these values or what have you. But this is, hey, give me the data you have up there. Save is very similar. Um, I can go ahead and for each of the preferences that my application is tracking, I've got this upsert. It's actually an extension method I created. 
and basically is saying, hey, if, if the preference I've got already has an ID issued to it, then it must be an update. Otherwise, it's an insert. Um, so just a handy little utility method that I, that I added there to help out. Um, let's see. The last thing I need to do is I need to update my fetch and my update. Uh, so if I go up here. And so I'm going to take fetch, which right now goes to disk, basically, you know, saves to local storage. And instead, I'm going to tell it to use my little uh, singleton helper class. And I'm going to say get preferences, which goes ahead and makes the mobile services call. And my update is going to do very similar. I'm going to throw away the code that saves to, to, to local disk. And I'm just going to call my save preferences. So basically, the key is, hey, write and get from the server, fantastic. Let's just go ahead. And, um, and, and you know, use the table objects instead. And if I hit run here, uh, I've got my Android emulator running. And let's get the UWP going next to it. Okay. Now, this is where I was talking about earlier. The Wi-Fi has been giving me an interesting bit of hassle, and I think the Android emulator um, running on my machine and then going to the Wi-Fi is not going to cooperate. We'll see, but right now it's trying to fetch data and failing miserably, and, and you see the save and the load are, are kind of grayed out, but the UWP is working happily. If it comes along, great, but we'll see where we go with that. If I go to Fuchsia, and I save my values and then go to, to, to green and reload. It is reading and writing to the database in Azure. Um, and the, it illustrates so much better when you can bring up another device and show that you're exchanging your properties between two devices. Um, unfortunately, uh, despite my greater efforts, it did not want to behave. Um, yeah, it's. It's not going to go. Um, where are we at time-wise? OK. Well, please take my word for it. Uh, download the code, run it yourself. Um, I, I, I could park here and try and fight with the network, but I'll try and move forward a little bit, and, and, and we'll just go from there. Oh, oh no, and now the Android has uh, has simply timed out trying to get to the network. So the Android one is unhappy with the, 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 the local Wi-Fi configuration. I even tried tethering, and, and, and even that wouldn't work. So um, let's just move forward. OK. Well, what we saw here was, great, I, I can write settings. And theoretically, I'm exchanging them between my devices. Um, but the problem is, I'm not personalizing it in any way. It doesn't know that I've put it in there. It's, I didn't set a user ID anywhere. It's just going there. To personalize this stuff, we get into authentication and authorization. Who are you? And, and what tools do we have to facilitate this? In mobile apps, out of the box, it does have built-in support for several identity providers, uh, being Azure Active Directory, Twitter, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft accounts. Um, also, there's a new feature that's come into Azure called Azure Active Directory B, uh, B2C, Business to Consumer. Um, and it aims to also be an aggregation of social, um, um, uh, uh, well, various, including the social identity uh, provider systems, um, as well as providing its own back end uh, and, and its own um, uh, user store. It's a little bit different in that B2C loses Twitter support and gains Amazon and LinkedIn support, uh, at least today, and it's going to be continuing to grow. Also, with um, the built-in um, uh, app services uh, identity, when you go to log in, you kind of have to say ahead of time, I'm going to log into Facebook. I'm going to log into Azure Active Directory. With the um, with B2C, 
you kind of just say, I'm logging into B2C, and it knows which ones you've configured and will give you the option of choosing at login time. Um, you could do that in your own app with the um, app services version, but you'd have to kind of write the code yourself to, to put the different buttons for the user to click. Whereas B2C, it waits for the challenge to come up, and, and as part of the challenging the user, they select which one they want to log into. Another one is in app services, the, you, get, you can request back claims or graph information from the um, environment you've logged into. In B2C, the claims, uh, the information is homogenized across whatever identity providers are there. It's kind of flattened out. Talking about the app services version, it supports both server and client flows. Server flow, uh, to, to kind of uh, distill it, is I'm going to log into my server, and it's going to say, oh, nope, you need to authenticate, um, or access my server. You need to authenticate. Um, go here to authenticate, and you go, and you pay, and you type in and, and your, your things, and it gives you back a token, and you use that in your continued exchanges. The client flow is, hey, I want to log into Facebook, and I'm going to use the Facebook SDK to do it, or some other mechanism. Typically, it's, you know, you'll take the SDK of the identity provider and you'll log in directly using the mechanisms they provide you. Azure Act, uh, uh, your mobile app is completely uninvolved in the process at this point. It'll return you a token and you can use that along with their SDK to access their services and party on their services and get the information you want. But then I can take also that token and pass it into Azure Active, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> to Azure mobile apps and say, oh, by the way, I've already authenticated over here against Facebook, and you know that I'm able to authenticate it against Facebook, so just use this token that Facebook gave me, and, and trust me, I'm authenticated. Um, so there's a subtle difference there, but, and, and, and the reasons why. Um, let's actually take a look at adding authentication. Where are we at? Time? OK, yep. Okie dokie. So, First step in adding authentication, we go on up to our portal. And I have to refresh this because it's not showing my project yet. And we're going to turn on authentication for our web app, our mobile app here. So I go to the preferences demo server. And yeah, everybody can see how much money I've got in my MSDN subscriptions. Thank you for this new feature, Azure. Um, okay, so where'd they move it today? Um, there we go, authentication and authorization. I'll go ahead and turn it on, and I've got a couple options. I'm actually going to say, hey, if a request comes in unauthenticated, right here it's saying, okay, if, if an, any unauthenticated request comes in, redirect them to here. I'm actually going to tell them, nope, go to my code. Just go to my code, and it'll tell you what to do. Um, it, I'm also going to use Azure Active Directory just because it's very easy to set up in the, in, in the span of a demo. I can go ahead and say express, create a new Azure Active Directory, name demo server, OK. And if I hit save, when I hit save, it'll provision that for me. If I selected advanced in the Azure Active Directory option, that's where I could put in the values to get it to use Azure Active Directory B2C. Um, if I select like Google, um, I provide the, I would register, go to Google, there's instructions right here in this link, I get my client ID and my secret, and it'll go ahead and, and uh, configure things that way. In Facebook, I can select the scopes that I'm going to have access to, si similar process. But I've, I've configured it to do um, Azure Active Directory. The other thing I need to do in my code, because I've told it, you know what, let things come to my code, and my code will tell you whether or not you know, I, I require authentication. Just your typical MVC, uh, ASP.NET, I'm going to add an authorized attribute. If I add it to the class, it applies to all methods. If I add it to individual controller methods, it applies to only to those particular controller methods. So I get the, the ability to say, you know what, this requires authentication. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and update my business logic a little bit. And go ahead and select all of these and paste that down.
OK. So first of all, I've added this little user ID property that takes the ambient user, looks for its claims, and pulls the name identifier. And, and that's the, the user ID, a unique user identifier. I'm ah, always do that. Um, but then over here in get all, I've qualified my query to include a restrict where the user ID value matches the ambient user ID that I've pulled out. And then you know get uh, so the sing for a single one, I want to make sure that, by the way, that, that the user ID actually um, you know, that I restrict by user ID, so I'm just delegating to the get all preferences call. Um, patch, I will go ahead when somebody updates, take the user ID. Don't make the client provide this, because the client's going to lie to me. Do it on the server where I know I can be accurate. And then also post, same thing. Inserting a new one, set the user ID based on the, the incoming values. Um, let's go ahead and publish that on up to Azure. And of course, I've got a typo in here. Let's try this again. Right click, publish. OK. Now on the client side, I do have to do something a little bit nuanced in a Xamarin project because the specific sign-in request is a little bit different between Android and UWP. So basically, I got to do some injection or, or you know, basically I'm using an interface, this iAuthenticator interface, as a means by which, when it's time to to authenticate, um, I will go ahead and oops, wrong one. I'll go ahead and I've got the authenticator. These apps can set it when they initialize. And then I can delegate to their implementations of login and log out. Um, I've also got this handy little utility method here called um, get logged in claims, where I, I'm making a REST request to this magic endpoint here, and I'm passing along my authentication token. It will return me the claims that it knows about the signed in user from the server. It's kind of a special URL on the server that I can call to get from the client to get uh, claims for the currently signed in user. Um, let's see. So I've got all of that. Who's next? I've got to get my specific login and log out. I've got to do this in two places. So in the Android, I come to my main activity. And here's where the, the code is special. Login async requires a context to be passed in when you're working in Android. So there it is. Log out. Actually, I shouldn't have even. Uh, that just needs to do this. Likewise, in the UWP, I need to update that one slightly. So in my login async that I've got, um, I can just go ahead and lose the this. And then obviously it's the same exact code in the logout. Oop. There we go. What we're doing here is saying log in off that mobile services client. I'm calling in the login method. And I'm telling it I want to use Azure Active Directory. That's it. That's the one line of code that you have to write in order to do authentication. All the rest is UI and, and um, you know, a little bit of, of um, uh, PCL ceremony. In fact, there's a couple more UI pieces I want to do here. So I've got all that. Um, and I need to update my fetch preferences. And I'm just basically going to say, hey, if I'm not logged in, just don't, don't, go, don't even try and get the preferences. Um, and then also some magic to enable or disable controls. Oops. And there was one other fairly important thing I forgot to do in my UI. I've got some buttons, and I want to uncomment them. And now, being as I don't trust my Android project anymore, and we're running out of daylight here, Go. 
Okay, so with that line, with, uh, you know, with that, checking that setting, having it spin that up for me, that, 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 um, yeah, that um, having it create the um, Active Directory uh, user uh, application registration for me. Um, if I go ahead and hit login, it now knows to bring up the login. If I go to user1 at uh, cotbdemo dot dot I got my user, I've signed in. Um, I haven't saved anything for this user yet. If I go to Fuchsia, um, oops, sorry, if I go to Fuchsia and uh, save values, it'll save the values to that particular user. And then if I go ahead and log out and log in as user two at CODB demo. Sure enough, it doesn't have those settings for me. Um, you know, it'll just, whoops, wrong, misclick. Um, you know, it's, it's saved it for the other user, so now I'm isolated, my data's been personalized, and if I bring up the claims, I can see I was authenticated with a password, here's the information we know about the user, the IP they sourced from, and, and, and whatnot. These, the server is able to give me the information about the signed in user. Again, a lot more effective when I can actually bring up the Android client and kind of show the stuff flowing side by side. Um, we're running out of time here. The, I've got slides in here explaining uh, offline data sync and content for it. Other honorable mentions include um, notifications. Uh, easy, you know, they're fairly easy to configure with the Azure notification hubs. Uh, takes care of a lot of the ceremony that you have to deal with, with tracking devices and remembering failed requests and, and all of those things with notifications makes it real simple to handle notifications through your mobile applications. They've got an implementation of file synchronization. So not only is it just offline data sync, but I can also tell it, hey, handle files. A lot of times we tend to like stream files into databases, which is just kind of wrong uh, or kind of ooey. Um, so the, the, the file sync uh, helps work with the, uh, the Azure blob storage for that. Other things in app services, I mentioned deployment slots, AB, web jobs for background processing. Um, this is the bit of an eye chart, bunch of good resources for working with this. The SDKs that are open source and where to get to them, like I said, I'll tweet the URL for this a little bit later and I'll work with the conference people to make sure these slides are available. They've got a great little sample, the field engineer sample, uses mobile apps as the back end for an application that say a cable service repairman or, or you know, a field engineer would use to track jobs and it works with offline sync and all of that. So it's a good little sample to walk through to figure out all the you know, nuances of a more complete application. The to-do I mentioned. Uh, videos, Donna Malieri from the team had a um, mo uh, cross-platform mobile apps that build this year. Uh, I believe she demos the, um, the file sync. And then uh, Adrian Hall, also from the mobile apps team, is doing this, did this series, 30 Days of Azure Mobile Apps a blog post. More important to that URL and the 30 days things, he's in the middle of writing a book on Azure Mobile Apps. He doesn't have an Amazon link or anything for it, but he'll be updating that through his blog here. So good you know, place for resources for this stuff. Also, yeah, thank you all very much. Um, also, they just announced last Thursday, they're doing this little survey uh, if you complete the survey and tell them about the mobile apps you're building and the things you're interested in, you can enter to win a Surface 3. Um, and like I said, that's a link in the slides that'll, that'll go ahead and take you there and I'll be posting all of those. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, we've got like a minute. Are there any, is there any questions from the... <laughs> well, thank you all for being here so early in the morning. I, I appreciate it. Hey, what's the market like for mobile apps? Um, for the back-end services, it's a tough thing. I don't have visibility into just how many people are using it. You go to their website, the Azure.com website and mobile apps, and they've got a lot of big names that are using it, but as far as turning it into a raw number, I, I don't know. 
Um, to, to using this particular technology, I'm trying to think of, of what. Uh, a combination, mobile apps, web apps. Uh, I mean, right now I'm I'm working on on. Do um, you have a lot of requests for mobile apps? Um, not getting a lot ourselves, no. Mm -hmm. um, the marketplace is not like not like a web space. Huh? No. Like no, I think it's fair to say at this point it's 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 definitely not like the web space. A lot of our business, be fair, is is cloud and um, enterprise um, modern web. NBC and Angular, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. But I love this stuff, so. <laughs> <laughs>